If you make the answer yes easy, you're likely to get yes as an answer. Right. If you make the answer no easy, you're likely to get no as an answer. Hey, this is Kenny Aronoff at Uncommon Studios LA, and you're listening to Staring at the World with Bodine's Kurt Newman, a T. Torrance Productions original podcast. Everybody, this is Kurt Newman, and this is the Staring at the World podcast. Today, speaking to Mr. Miles Copeland, who is a manager from a little ways back, but worked with many bands of my era, bands like The Police and R.E.M., The Go-Go's, and many, many other groups. He also started the very hip label called IRS Records, which everybody wanted to be on back in those days because it meant you were going to get listened to because they had so many great acts coming out. Today we go back and we talk about the beginnings of the police and the beginnings of his career in management, which was unexpected. We talk about him discovering the song Roxanne and uh, what a surprise that was to everybody and what it meant to his career and the career of the police going forward. We talk about um, him almost getting bankrupt in his early days of starting to manage bands and having to recover from that. Really, a lot of what we're speaking about on this podcast is going to be what I call the creative element. In everyday life, it doesn't really matter if you're in a band or you're in a family or you're in a small business or a big business. In any given moment, you're called upon creative moments where you have to adapt and do your own thing, break some rules, and uh, find a way, sometimes around the norms, to uh, do what you want to do in life or succeed at things you want to do. And um, I think it's not always presented as an important thing. At least when I was growing up in school and stuff, they didn't push creativity. They pushed spelling correctly and mathematics and all the theories, but... They didn't spend much energy on how important this creative element is in our lives, which I always thought it was probably the most important. I think it's at the core of almost everything we do. So join us for more um, today, Mr. Miles Copeland, and there'll be more to follow. Thanks. Okay, well, Mr. Miles Copeland, I'm glad to speak to you. I've been a fan of your work for many, many years. I was getting out of high school at the time when, you know, the police and REM and all those bands were doing so great. And, uh, you know, you've just been legendary in my world and uh, somebody that everybody knows working in the music industry. So I'm glad you could make it to talk to me today. I really appreciate you being here. Well, I'm sorry I was late. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, it's nice that, that, nice that you say I'm, I'm, uh, legendary or something but i it seems that i'm um i'm i I, i'm not getting senile i'll tell you that but i'm but i definitely (laughs) seem to be uh, sometimes getting a bit late anyway i'm very glad to talk to you and i'm sorry that i had to make you wait a bit before i could talk oh no problem being late you know what they say like if we uh, wanted to be on time we would have got day jobs kind of thing so it's perfectly fitting not a problem at all so um You've got a new book out, which is really about your life, your experiences, and growing up. Two Steps Forward, One Step Back. I thought that was a very appropriate title for being in the music industry. Um, There's several things I'd like to talk about. One thing I'm doing with this podcast is I'm just kind of trying to focus on what I call the creative element in life, you know. Um, You very often talk about it, and it's been a part of my life as well, is you don't always know what you're doing and situations and you really have to adapt sometimes to what's going on and i feel like you know that that creative element is kind of at the core of everything we do but it doesn't get a whole lot of recognition in our everyday lives but in your book and your interviews that i've seen you talk a lot about that about having to do things your way but i wanted to start um with kind of 
your growing up, you know, your your childhood, because it was really kind of unique, I thought, and your parents and your different countries that you were raised in and the different experiences you had. So can we start there today and maybe you talk about sure. early early growing up and where you were and how it influenced you? Yeah, I mean, the reality was, you know, when you're growing up, you don't really appreciate the fact that your life is unique or different or whatever, you know. I mean, what I did know is that when I went to Egypt or Lebanon or Syria, I was an American and I was sort of singled out as being somebody that, you know, as an American, you're sort of looked up at, look, looked up to. And then we would go back to America. We'd be stationed in America for a couple of years. And then you would just be another American sort of lost in the, in the morass, you know, and nothing special. And, and of course, you would, you would arrive and, you know, you, you would be coming into situations where people had friends since childhood and you were the new guy, you know. Yeah. So you would sort of arrive in America and become shy and introverted because you, you were the new guy. And then you'd go overseas and you'd be welcomed as the, you know, the, the American, you know, and everybody was a, sort of a fish out of water. So that was really what my upbringing was like. So I didn't really appreciate um, much about growing up um, mm. I- until later on, really, um, when I got into music business and people found it quite interesting, you know. Yeah, it was normal to you at the time, I'm sure. But it is interesting. Your dad worked at the CIA, and your mom was at British Intelligence, and uh, that's not like not everybody has parents in that situation. So it seemed a little bit like you had a really interesting scenario going on with your life there. Yeah, well, I, I had you know when I got to be sort of high school, and <clears throat> I knew my father. By that time, my father had had left the CIA. And I knew that his past had been that, you know, and I figured, well, it sounds like an interesting thing. You know, I'd, I'd read, you know, James Bond, you know, and you sort of imagine the, you know, the, the, yeah. the life of the super spy. You know? yeah. And of course, my father said, sorry, it's nothing like James Bond. Yeah. Let's get that straight. Secondly, he said, don't go to the CIA. You're going to hate it. There are a lot of people that don't know what they're doing and you're going to be you're not going to like it. So my advice is don't go into CIA. Yeah. So uh, I sort of then went into high, went into college, not really knowing what I was going to do, except that I knew that I had sort of spent many years in the Middle East. I could get by with Arabic. I knew I had a lot of Arab friends. So I figured, well, maybe it'll be Middle East business that I get into, you know. And so getting into the music business was a complete left field <laughs> Luke, basically. I knew nothing. I mean, what do you learn about the music business being in Beirut, Lebanon? Nothing, you know. Yeah, but um, that's that's what I feel like. I I didn't even get on a plane until the first time the record company flew me to L.A. to talk to them. So I grew up in this Midwest life where I was just like, I didn't see a whole lot. You know, my parents went to work in the morning, came home at night, had a lot of drinks, and that was my life. And so I think what I'm saying is like, that from where I was standing as a child, you know, you going to different countries like that, having that experience early on, sometimes I think that adds to um, your ability to adapt in, in situations. And like I want to get to here later about uh, how you dealt with the music industry when you did get there, because you didn't exactly even know how you got in it or how you got there. I think uh, I was reading that you had a you went and got a degree in economics and then yeah i think basically i think if i if i were to look back on it and say okay what what influence was it you spend your life sort of as a fish out of water you know you're right. you're you're a you're a stranger in a strange land basically right. and so you know mm. going into the music business which was a strange land to me at the time you know was really no different you know so <clears throat> perhaps you know, being in a, a fish out of water, I was used to that. So going into the music business where I would be, again, a fish out of water, you know, um, was not so strange after all. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I, I mean, that was kind of the feeling I got that, you know, sometimes your childhood like that and being in situations that are different kind of help you to um, adjust to those situations. And so you kind of found yourself stumbling into the music industry 
you know, what was the decision to really do that, do you think, of, of you know, what your first, like, thing that happened to you where you thought, I'm going to, uh, I'll try this in the music industry? Was it, you know, was it Stewart's playing in bands or was it something before that? Well, Stewart's playing in bands sort of opened my eyes to the possibility, but I'd never really thought about being in the music business until... I had met this British group that had come to Lebanon to play in the summer and they had, they had sort of suggested that I had, you know, I had the right chutzpah and the right attitude. So maybe I should be a manager. Well, I thought nothing of it. And then I, I, you know, went to London on my way to getting drafted to the U S army. And, uh, they came to see me and they said, uh, you should manage us. And I thought, well, that's a crazy idea. I'm getting drafted. So I reported for duty promptly got rejected because I have high arches, apparently, <laughs> which my doctor said, uh, don't worry, you're going to get accepted because they're not bad enough. But anyway, I got rejected. I was the only one of 2000 people that got rejected. So <laughs> I started my music career as a reject, you know, so I sent an email to this group saying, well, it looks like I'll be back in London soon, you know, and they, they sent an email saying, God bless your feet. <laughs> I arrived in London, they came to see me and they said, be our manager. And I guess at that point, I had nothing else to do. It was like, well, I'm not going to be in the army for two years. I have no idea what I'm going to do. What the hell? So I became a manager. Yeah, that's very similar to um, what we did. We were, lived in a small town called Waukesha, Wisconsin. There wasn't a lot going on. And we basically approached a friend to say, we need somebody to do this other stuff for us. And you know, and he agreed, and we stumbled and tumbled through things. And you talked about um, sometimes that's the best way to get through situations like that, to to not overthink it really, and not look for all the reasons of things that could go wrong, but maybe just uh, stumble through it and don't be afraid to make mistakes. You want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, well, I, I mean, the title of the book, you know, Two Steps Forward, One Step Back, is sort of an admission that, you know, I don't care how smart you are, you know, how lucky you are, you know, uh, you're going to make mistakes, you know, so you're going to take two steps forward. Great. You know, but you're also going to take those steps backwards. You know, you're, you're going to make mistakes. And so that's part of the game. That's part of what you're learning. And sometimes you can learn more from mistakes than you can from, from, uh, you know, successes. So from, from my point of view, uh, the title of the book is a reflection of that of that fact that, you know, you, you have to move forward and don't let a mistake hold you back because you're going to make mistakes. You know, I don't care whether you're, you know, the head of Apple or the head of General Motors or I don't care what it is. You're going to make mistakes. You think sometimes that is kind of a strength in that um, what I felt like is we didn't necessarily know what we were doing all the time, even musically you know, on our instruments, we didn't even know. I was, I had grown up as a drummer, and so I was a big fan of, you know, Stewart's playing and stuff, but before long, I found myself holding a guitar and singing, which is something I never had anticipated doing in my life, and then I had to adapt to it. You know, I had to figure out something that was going to be my thing. Do you think sometimes that's a strength in not really knowing what you're doing and having then to come up with your own way of doing it? Well, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the most successful inventions were mistakes. You know, somebody's messing around in the laboratory and mixes the wrong chemicals, and lo and behold, out comes some fantastic new thing. You know, right. so I think that's part of part of it. You know, I mean, I started as a manager. I ended up sort of running a record company, then a publishing company, and you know, so I sort of did everything you can, you need to do in the music side, you know, but I had not started off ever thinking I'm going to have a record company, but right. it was really out of necessity because I saw all these bands that couldn't get deals and decided, well, you know what? I can do a record company. I, I know enough about the business and uh, how bad, how hard can it be? You know, and it really wasn't that hard. So I started the record company and next thing I know I'm signing you know, punk bands. Well, before that, I was signing, you know, Climax Blues Band and Renaissance, various other groups. Um, and then and then later on, I, I morphed into doing uh, the punk rock world, you know, 
So I, I sort of ended up doing things I'd never intended doing, but that's part of the game, basically, you know. So, you know, and even writing the book, I had, I had always thought about writing a book, but then again, you know, to actually sit down and write, you know, and you think, well, I didn't like the idea of a memoir because it, it was too much of a, well, you know, this is what I did and aren't I great and you should read this because, you know, I accomplished so much, you know. It just seemed a bit egotistical. Right. But right. I, when, when the COVID thing happened, I sort of said, well, you know what? I, I do have a story, you know, and there's a lot of things people can learn from that story, you know, and that was more interesting to me. So the idea that people could learn from my mistakes or my successes, uh, sort of as an inspirational book, more as a more than a, you know, memoir. That was really what I intended to do. So I, I wrote the book from the standpoint that, you know, I hope people learn something from this. So I, I hope my son's going to read it and and get something out of it. You know, yeah. um, all right, maybe they'll learn about what their father did, but you know, so what? You know, but if you can apply some of these things to running a restaurant or a small business or whatever, then the book has a relevance beyond just what I did, you know? And that was really what I intended to do as a book. Yeah, I agree. I think that was a great way to approach it. I find it very hard to talk about or even remember a lot of stories. Um, but I think when people start to talk to you about it, a lot of that comes out. I just think that when you can write it in that kind of voice, that's a great way to do it instead of just focusing. I've seen some people write books where like, then I did this and then I did that. And then I, but I think by making the point that uh, you don't have to have it all figured out, that you can just be as a creative as you can in a moment. And, and like you said about some of the music you signed, you figured uh, that if you liked music, someone else might like it too. You didn't try to overthink it. Yeah, I just figured, look, if I like it, you know, I'm not that crazy. You know, there must be other people like me who like it, too. You know, and that was really the criteria for signing some of that stuff. So I, I didn't think, well, you know, what's it going to sell? You know, is this going to fit some kind of niche? I just thought, well, I like it, so I'm going to sign it. And the, what I did also, and it's part of the lesson of the book, is that I also made sure that I didn't overspend. You know, I said, look, if I like it, but. I want to be free enough to sign what I like, then it's got to be price effective. It's got to be, you know, it can't be too expensive, you know? So when I signed the go-go's for instance, you know, nobody else would sign them. You know, I, I was lucky that uh, everybody said, well, you know, girl groups don't happen. So we're not interested. And I came along and I thought girl group, wow, what a great gimmick, you know, <laughs> and they have great little songs and uh, you know, how bad could it be? But we made a deal that was not, you know, certainly wasn't lining their pockets, but it was basically what I could afford. Thankfully, it went to number one, so we all did very well out of it. But the reality was that most of the decisions I made were based on, number one, I like it. Number two, it's I, I can afford to do it. Do you think there's much of that in the music industry anymore as far as... Yeah, I think there's still people who... who you know, do things because they like to. But I know that the music business now has become big business. So a lot of the guys at record companies, you know, they'll, they'll look and see how you're doing on, on the social media. They'll look at Facebook. They'll see how many likes you have. They'll see how many, you know, how many followers you have. And if you have enough, then they think, well, that person's interesting enough because the market has always said we're interested. Very few are going to take a shot and say, well, this 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 artist has no likes and has no following but boy the music's really great i'm gonna sign it you know that that is kind of a rarity i would think these days yeah i agree i thought um back in the 70s and 80s you know music meant a lot to people and they would go really deep into records you know it wasn't about you had this one single for a week or two on the music charts I remember records last, lasting a year and a half, you know, of just going deep into the record. And you think there's, you know, any any chance of that kind of stuff coming back around uh, with the way the industry is and the way streaming is? I, I feel like a lot of it has gotten controlled by the major labels in a way that it really wasn't when in the 70s and 80s when I think we were 
both working and interested in the music industry and when we got into it. And I, I keep wondering if it'll ever cycle back around to that, that the majors won't have such control over it and people will start to listen to other stuff again. I thought when streaming came on, that was kind of the idea, but then I felt like the majors just kind of came in and controlled it all. And so I, what's your feeling on all that? Well, I, you know, <clears throat> I, people say, you know, everything's changed and, you know, and all that. And I would say, well, yes and no. But the, the reality is that if it, there's one rule, people would, you know, artists would say, well, man, it's about the music. You know, it's got to be about the music. And I would say, well, you know what? That's number two. Number one is you got to get noticed. If you don't get noticed, people are never going to hear your music. And that's always been the case. That's been the case for Frank Sinatra, for Elvis Presley. You know, Elvis Presley was got attention because he wiggled his legs on TV. You know, right. the Beatles had long hair. You know, they right. were from England. You know, so a lot of the a lot of the great stars, you know, you, you noticed them because you heard something about them that had nothing to do with music. I mean, the first thing I heard about the animals was they didn't bathe. You know, <laughs> and people said, "Oh, they don't bathe." So. You know, that was what was interesting. The Beatles, oh, yeah, they, those long-haired guys from Liverpool, you know. So that that rule of, you know, getting noticed has always been there. Spotify can help you get noticed. And then it's uh, then number two becomes, all right, now you're noticed. Now do people like the music? And, you know, there's always been one-hit wonders, you know, going way back to oh, the yeah. beginning of, you know, the music <laughs> business, you know. So there have been plenty of those, and that's always been the case. But there'll be some that will always come through and last, you know. Um, it seems like things are faster now, but the rule is still the same. First, you got to get noticed, whether it be Lady Gaga wearing wild clothes or Elton John doing crazy stuff or, you know, Kiss painting their faces or whatever. You get noticed, then people get into the music or not. And that rule has always been there. And, you know, a lot of people kind of want to say, oh, everything's changed. And, you know, but remember back in, in the day, you know, the majors would sign 10 acts, only one of whom would succeed. So they had a yeah. one out of 10 success ratio, which isn't very good, you know. Right. So they've never been particularly good at, at signing acts, you know. So. And sometimes it's the acts problem, you know. I mean, I, I've had many acts that shoot themselves in the foot. I talk about it in the book, you know, that it was their fault that they failed. Other times the record company failed to figure it out, you know. It's the record company's fault or the manager's fault or a combination of all those things, you know. It could be anything. So it's very, very easy to say that the record companies are at fault or the record company failed. But I know many acts that fail too, you know. So it, it's it 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 really depends on a bit of luck, a bit of circumstance. But the main thing is if you believe and you keep on doing it, you take two steps forward and have your one or one or two steps back. Yeah. Eventually, you can make it. But you have to believe and keep fighting to do what you believe in. Yeah, I think so. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I wonder. You know, if the police and REM and Go Go's and stuff would have gotten signed, you know, if they would have had enough likes and stuff like it's kind of based on today or not, or if some of that chance taking by the labels is what kind of fostered more of the um, interesting acts that would come up because they didn't always know what was going to work and they may sign 10 and they weren't sure. So they were kind of trying to throw a lot at the wall and see what stuck, you know, and it wasn't well, so that, much. Well, that's kind of what happened, you know. I mean, what I did with the police is I figured, look, you know, all the criteria that makes a record company want to sign an act did not exist. There was no press. There was no following. Right. There was really nothing to recommend the group except the music. So I went to a and Records and I said, look, I, I know very well that if I ask for a lot of money, they're going to say no because it's easier to say no when you're when there's a bit of risk involved. So I said, "Look, here's the deal. It's free. The record's yours. Right. You've already signed it. Now just listen to the music. What do you got to lose?" And the A and R guy listened and he thought, "Well, 
gee, I mean, I, my, my budget's not going to be affected. My, my career is not going to be affected. If it fails, who cares? Yeah, let me listen to the music. And I'll bet you this is the only time he ever really listened to the music. And he liked it. Yeah. So A&M signed the group. And I did the same thing when I went, I, you know, when I went to Jerry Moss to make IRS records. You know, I said, look, I can't recommend this music. I mean, it's not particularly happening on the radio here in America. Everybody is sort of thinks punk rock world is a joke. But I think a lot of this stuff has a value. So here's the deal. I don't need your money. Give me no money. Just have your salespeople press up what they think they can sell. So there's no risk. Just give me a label and distribute it. And he said, well, what the hell? So he said, yes. And that's how I started IRS. So in other words, I made it for I made the yes easy. Right, right. I made the deal affordable. And that's part of the lesson of, of, of my life, really, really, is that if you make the answer yes easy, you're likely to get yes as an answer. Right. If you make the answer no easy, you're likely to get no as an answer. So I, I figured, well, I need yes as an answer, and I'm going to make it easy. So I'll say, look, it's for free or for very cheap. Make it very enticing, and you're likely to get a yes. And that's basically how I started, how I got going with the police and the IRS records. Right. I did like in the earlier years with the majors, though, when they were throwing stuff at the wall, um, that they did have a network of support out there kind of for acts uh, once you got to that level, if you were lucky enough to get to that level. And it was a little harder well, to get lot, to that. A lot of the getting there depended on the act itself. Right. It depended on whether they had a good manager. You know, you can't just think, oh, I've just signed a record deal. Oh, I've made it. You know. Yeah. No, that's the starting point. Right, you know, exactly. That's, that's getting to first base. Yeah. Now you've got to help get the second base, third base and home run. You know, it can't be just the record company. You know, you can't leave yourself in the hands of other people. You've got to be able to throw it, throw yourself in as well. And that was part of the success of IRS records with A&M. We said, look, you know, we're prepared to roll our shirt sleeves up and do the fighting, too. You know, we don't expect just you guys to be out there trying to get us on the radio. We'll do it, too. And that was quite refreshing to them because they they had been used to groups getting signed and then sort of sitting back and waiting for the record company to make them happen right which of course happened one out of every 10 right hey everybody thank you so much for listening to the podcast today um i hope you can subscribe to this and give us a thumbs up review and um share it and do whatever you can to spread it around because uh we need you know people like you to listen or i'm just in a room talking to nobody so Please uh, join us and um, thank you. <laughs>